welcome to Board Games with Niramas. I'm Joseph and I'm here today with Draco, of course, but we also have a guest today because we are going to check out Go, which is a game that I don't know anything about. Uh, Dra Draco doesn't know anything about it either, even though he's seen it, I think, in his travels and so on as a dragon. But we have Ola here, who's going to help us understand how this game works. So let's head over to him instead and he'll explain to you and to us how this game works. Hello, my name is Ola and uh, I am here to explain a bit about Go to you. For those that uh, hasn't heard anything about uh, this game before, uh, I can tell you that you have missed something. And uh, it's not exactly news because it's between two and a half and four thousand years old. Uh, it's actually one of the board games that uh, has had the same rules for the longest amount of time. Uh, so, it is extremely simple. It is played on a board with a grid of 19 by 19 lines. On these lines, on the intersections, you place black and white stones. And there are a few simple rules that governs how you place the stones. And the thing with Go is the complexity. The rules are simple, but the freedom how you place the stones and the large board makes the game very complex. So, for example, you place a stone on an intersection. Black is the one that starts. Now you say that this stone has four freedoms. The lines that leads out and the adjacent intersections are empty. If white comes and plays beside black, now black only has three freedoms left. Say that white has the chance to place another stone beside here. Two freedoms. And now one freedom. In this situation, you say that the black stone is in Atari. And yes, that's the same name as the computer game, because the founder of Atari is a Go player. And in this situation, black has the chance of escaping by playing here. Because now those two stones are connected. And in effect, those stones has three freedoms. If black doesn't play there, and instead allows white the chance to surround the black stone, then that stone is dead, it's captured and is taken off the board. That is the foundation of this game. That's really most of the rules. But how do you win? What, in what strategy do you use when you place the stones on the board? Well, the Chinese name for this game is Wei Qi, and that is basically translated to the surrounding game. And the concept of the game is that you want to surround territory and take control of territory, and also, if possible, to surround groups of the opponent's stones and kill them. So, what you want to do is play stones that makes it impossible for the opponent to establish territory inside. And since the board is so large, it is a, a give and take of... Uh, uh, you have to play for territory or influence, and um, there are a myriad of possibilities. So, this is the basic rule is avoid to be surrounded. But there are, let's put up a hypothetical situation here. Let's say that black has a group like this. Now, this situation. Black is completely surrounded. 
and has only one freedom left for this whole group. So the next time white plays here, all those black stones are taken off the board. In order to avoid that, you want to build formations that contains two of these openings. This by the way called an eye. And if you do like this, if you manage to have a group that has two separate eyes this way. Now in order for this black group to be captured, to be uh, to, for white to take both of those remaining freedoms, white would have to place in both at the same time. But you're not allowed to place in a place where it's suicide. So this group is now immortal. You can't kill it. And it don't, don't have to be just one left in each. Say that the group looks like this. Now there's two points, uh, two, two intersections here. But this group is still unkillable. I mean, white can play, uh, place there. That's allowed, because now white still has one freedom. But white only do, does that, and now there's only one left. And then you have this situation with two eyes, and the group can't be killed. So, in regular play, this is never placed here. White doesn't play in there because it's understood that that is suicide. It doesn't lead to anything, just a waste of time. What happens when you play on the sideline? The effect is that you don't need as many stones to form for make a group that can live forever, that is immortal, like that. Because this also has two eyes, but it doesn't take as many stones. And if you try it in the corner, it takes even less stones. So that is why in a proper game from start to finish, we usually the play starts to concentrate on the corners because that is where it's easiest to to make living groups. And then you play for the sides, and then the game spreads into the middle. So that that's a consequence of where it's easiest to make territory. And afterwards, when the game is over, these would point uh, would uh, count as points. Because you give it get points for the empty intersections and for prisoners. So that is basically the the rules of Forgo. So and as you can see here, we have two different size boards. This is the full sized, it's 19 by 19 on the grid. And these are the traditional Japanese stones, they are made of slate and clamshell and there is uh, enough stones to cover the whole board. It's rarely used but uh, that is the case. But it's difficult to learn the game on the big board because you have to master the fighting, so to say, in the small scale play and the large scale strategy at the same time. It's easier to start with this board. That is a 9x9 nine nine grid. And here we have, they look basically the same, but these stones are glass. And it works like this, that black always starts. And you have freedom to place anywhere on the board. So one common open, opening is right here in the middle. That gives a lot of flexibility and white has to settle for, uh, has to decide what side he wants to play at. And now black in turn can respond however he wants. Say that here. As soon as white get in contact 
with that it starts to get complicated because then there is fighting. Black has to respond because black doesn't want that stone to be surrounded. So as soon as you get in touch with each other then there the fighting begins. And usually it takes a few moves first uh, when the opponents, so to speak, circle around each other and try to get, build influence for the upcoming battle. And now the white stone is in danger of being surrounded. So he better do something like that. Black places there. That is not very good for white, because now if black were to build up here, he would cut those stones from that stone. So white will likely play, for example, there. And a natural response here for black would be down here. White may... If white plays there, he protects that stone from being surrounded. But it's very defensive move. If he plays there, he builds more territory. Black follows. White, say so let white does that. He tries to push. I like to think of it as like uh, water. Uh, you have to you try to flow around the edges and find openings. Black has to, almost has to uh, stop that. But now that stone is in Atari. If black were to play there, then that stone would be dead, so white has to defend. Now, is there somewhere black could play that would build larger influence? Yes, he could play, play up here. And that would secure this corner, basically. It would be a good idea to play somewhere around here. Uh, so that white doesn't jump in here and try to invade. A, a single stone placed here or here would be, make that very difficult for white. But there's one place that is uh, necessary to play right now. And that is there. Because if white plays there, white, then black can escape to that there. But white will follow after. And black tries to, explain, to, to run away there, but there it stopped. So, then white plays there and they are dead. So black has to secure that first. And that can be done as simple as that. White plays there, for example. Now this is poorly played by white, because he has allowed black to take the initiative and press him white into much less than half of the board. And as it's black's turn and he plays there. Now for white to have any chance of winning this game, he will have to invade here. And he has to do that and survive. And in order to survive, you remember what I told you, you have to build basically two eyes. And to do that in this area, while black is trying to stop you, will be very difficult. If white had had the chance to do it before this stone was placed, it would be a much uh, different proposition. But right now, it will be difficult. Uh, and if the... Um, both players agree that there's not much more to do, then the game is over here. It, it works like this. If white thinks that no, no, there's no point for me to place anymore, I can't do anything that brings the game forward, then white passes. And then it's up to black. Does he agree? If he, if he also thinks that no, there's nothing more I can do that brings the game forward, I pass as well. When both have passed in succession, then the game is over. 
and this game would then, and then you and then you count uh, the liberties that exist here in on each side so here it's r rather obvious that black has more than white you don't even have to count this in the case so here black wins okay so thank you so much to Ola for that explanation and We'll be back in part two where you can see Draco. Draco has been sitting here listening, very focused as you can see. And he is now ready to take on Ola and uh, yeah, we'll see how it goes. Uh, but don't miss the part two. You can just click the little R straight up here in the corner to go straight to part two and check out the actual gameplay. <laughs> Be like Draco. Follow board games with Niramas on Facebook at BGW Niramas. Board Games with Niramas is sponsored by Alara Games in Sweden. <laughs>